Thank you, guys. When death was arrested, whoo, clap the handcuffs on him. All right. One of the unique things about our church is <clears throat> our military folks that are here. Usually they don't stay very long, a couple, three years maybe at the most, and then Uncle Sam moves them along. But uh, today we're going to hear from John Untis. John has just returned from deployment and uh, had some uh, wonderful experiences with the Lord while on his deployment. And so, John, I'd like for you to come on up and, and share these with our people. And uh, <clears throat> as he comes, his wife Kristen is down here, and uh, we're going to be saying goodbye to these folks. Uh, they're PCSing uh, the end of this, this month, I believe it is, and going to San Antonio, Texas. So they're going to be out there in the dry heat, worse than us. It's going to be awful. <laughs> Just kidding. John, share with us. Good morning. So, uh, as Pastor Mark said, I did just get back from deployment a couple weeks ago. I was uh, stationed out of Germany, which was, of all the places I could have gone, was probably one of the best. Uh, but we were tasked, uh, I was part of the critical care air transport team, which is a subset of the air medical evacuation uh, transport that the Air Force primarily owns. So, basically, uh, we fly a mobile uh, intensive care unit in the air, and uh, our primary mission out of Andrews was actually, or out of Ramstein, was flying to Andrews. However, uh, with the mission tempo and, and what was going on in the theaters, uh, basic, we flew to Qatar, we were flying to uh, Afghanistan, uh, we were also flying to um, different places within the European theater as well for, uh, for folks that were getting hurt elsewhere. Um, and basically, we, we saw a lot of God's work pretty much done throughout the entire, uh, the entire time we were there, every one of our missions, and uh, put a little bit, into, a mo little bit more into perspective. Um, my team consists of one physician, myself, a, a critical care nurse, and a respiratory therapist. Uh, we were all stationed at Eglin, and uh, that's my team right there. Uh, to the left was the nurse, and in the middle was my restaurant therapist, and together we fly, and we're basically expected to do each other's jobs because we can fly um, up to three ventilated patients, which is on a, on a ventilator, or uh, and six total patients in the back of an airplane, uh, just our team. Uh, and in several circumstances, that actually did happen, uh, where we're actually uh, fully test saturated with, uh, with the number of patients, which was a little unique for the time of year, as we were expected everything to kind of calm down given the winter months, but everything picked up and we actually doubled the amount of missions that the previous team that we took over for actually did. Um, now, fortunately, I had, I had a wonderful team. They all had uh, shared a similar faith in, in God and we, we you know, usually said a prayer before every one of our missions. And uh, um, we, we saw God's work in every one of the patients that we saw because not everyone was able to make it back uh, alive, unfortunately. But the ones that we did, um, they were incredibly fortunate. And um, in several uh, circumstances, we actually had a lot of gunshot wounds, uh, primarily to the neck. Uh, and within millimeters, I mean, that, that they were, the, the wounds were to the carotid artery and, and more critical structures like that. And uh, see, seeing... Uh, you know, the soldiers and, and their families, but some of them actually came back with us. They met us in Germany, and, uh, and, and their faith in the Lord and, and the trust in us uh, really was a rewarding experience. Um, I don't know if there was any other pictures. Uh, looks like the, there's three of them that are kind of just on circulation here, but I think we had a few more, but uh, that's the back of the airplane. It was a C-17 was our uh, primary aircraft, but we had a few others that we flew on, uh, including like a very tiny C-21, but that was, we could only transport one on those. But uh, this, this airplane was uh, pretty large, and we can easily put over 80 patients on it. And that's, again, just another view from the inside there. That was one of my respiratory therapists. Uh, we, we had to switch teams somewhere in the middle uh, due to some other circumstances, but he, he was flying with us as well. And he was out of Travis. And then there's our holiday card. So uh, as rewarding as it was, it's definitely nice to be back. And uh, I was definitely thankful for the experience that we had. And, and definitely thank you for uh, allowing me to share my experience with, uh, with all of you. And we did have some downtime. So we had that was our Thanksgiving football game uh, with some of the uh, air medical evacuation teams that we had there. Uh, and then we also got to do a little traveling. That was in Austria that overlooked Switzerland and Germany. 
uh, at the same time. So that was, that was a really nice uh, um, part of the country that we were in. And just another view in the back of the aircraft that of one of the missions we were flying on. And this actually was a fairly unique circumstance. We actually picked up folks in Germany, and then we landed in France to pick up some more patients. That's actually in France right now, um, to pick up somebody else that was critically injured. And that was the, uh, we call that an AMBUS. Uh, it's a glorified ambulance uh, on a big truck, basically very uncomfortable, but it has everything that we need um, for, the, for an hour trip back. And this was another team actually out of Eglin. Um, they're kind of intermixed there. They were, uh, they were another critical care transport team. They were stationed down in Qatar and they were overlapped. So they were actually coming back from their deployment and they met us and we all went out to dinner. So and, uh, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, each person uh, in the military has a significant role, and uh, especially in, in deployments like that. So we thank you. Sorry to see you guys leave, but I know that's, uh, that's the next assignment for you guys. But hey, you know, you can you know, get them to move you back here. That would be great. Raise your kids here. That would be awesome. All right, uh, John chapter 5 is where we are today, and um, we have been seeing Jesus interacting with different people and uh, with a, a religious man who was very respected. Jesus said to him, you know, you must be born again if you're going to have eternal life. And then a woman who uh, had at least five different husbands and uh, the one that she was living with at the time was not her husband. So the contrast from somebody religiously respected and, and, and uh, all means sort of uh, lifted up as uh, the paragon of virtue and piety and then uh, this lady who is uh, way down on the other side of the scale. And then we have this man that we're going to talk about today in John chapter 5 at a pool I don't know if you're into pools that much. Uh, I try to stay away from as much as possible. Uh, with a physique like mine, you don't want to scare people to death. And um, You know, when I graduated from high school, I weighed 119 pounds and at a size 28 waist. And, you know, guys playing football and all that stuff, and, you know, there I was like a stick figure. And it hasn't changed much except for this right here. That, that has changed. So I stay away from pools and beaches as much as possible. And, um, but Jesus uh, was okay with going to a pool. So let's take a look at this. John 5, 1 through 18. I'll read through it, then we'll come back and make a few comments. Uh, when we get to verse 4, you'll probably find if you have a NIV or NASB or ESB or some modern translation... It will give you an asterisk or something in a footnote to say something about that verse, and we'll, we'll come back to it. I won't read it now as we go through, but we will when we get back to it. Now, after these things, this was after Jesus had talked with that woman at the well that we looked at last week, and he did another miracle in Cana of Galilee. The first one was turning water into wine, and this one, he healed a nobleman's son, but after this happened, he returns to Jerusalem. And it says, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews. It doesn't name which one. Uh, we don't know which one. They had numbers of them. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there is in Jerusalem, John says, by the sheep gate. There were a number of gates surrounding or in the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And this was one of them, the sheep gate. There was a pool. Uh, which is being called in Hebrew or Aramaic, uh, Beth Zatha, having five porches, among whom or among which there was lying a multitude or a number of sick people. Some were blind, some were lame, some were paralyzed. And uh, a certain man was there who had had his illness 38 years. That's a long time. And Jesus saw this guy, and he was 
lying there among the multitude, and he knew that uh, he had been there a long time. And he said to him, do you want to become whole or well? Do you want to become whole or well? And the sick man said, sir, I don't have anybody that when the water is troubled to take me into the pool while I'm trying to get there. He's most likely lame, paralyzed. He's crawling, is what he's saying. While I'm trying to get there, while I'm crawling to get there, somebody else quicker than me goes down and jumps in before me. And Jesus said, rise up, take up your mat and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and he picked up his mat, and he began to walk. But that was a Sabbath day. And therefore the Jews, the religious leaders, said to the healed man, it's the Sabbath day, and it's not proper for you to carry your mat. They were more worried about their rules and traditions than they were the man got healed. And he answered them, the one who made me well told me, take up your mat and walk. And they asked him, who is this man who told you, take up and walk? And the healed man said, I don't know. Now that won't pass for a profession of faith in anybody's church. Well, I don't know who did it. But anyway, for Jesus uh, had turned aside, it means... uh, to almost, in a sense, to turn your head aside to miss a blow, like somebody's swinging at you, and you turn your head. For Jesus turned aside, uh, and the crowd being in that place, and slipped away. After these things, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Look, you have become whole or well. Don't sin any longer in order that something worse might happen to you. The man went... And told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting. They began to persecute Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working also. Therefore, for this reason, all the more the Jews, the religious leaders were seeking to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but also he was saying that God was his own father, making himself equal with God. What a story. What an event. What a savior. But uh, a couple of things here about the text itself before we move into some, some truths that we see about Jesus. First of all, the name of the pool. In verse 2 it, uh, in the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts, and there are about 5,000 of them, folks. The Bible, the New Testament, is the most attested book that we have in history. All the writings of, of uh, Plato and Socrates and all those historians, we have more Greek manuscripts than anybody else, about 5,000 of them. But anyway, uh, there are several names given in the manuscripts, and part of the problem is the the name itself and the translation from Hebrew or Aramaic into Greek. One is Beth Zatha. That may be one that's printed in your text. It means house of olive oil. Another uh, possibility is Bethsaida, which is house of fishermen. Or Bethesda, Bethesda, which means house of mercy. One of the things that has helped us with this is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1945. In that cache of of books, of scrolls, there was a copper scroll. And in it is found this name of this pool in Aramaic. And it's Beth. Sadim, which has the M as the plural on it. It means house of pouring. And this helps us identify the name of this pool. Most likely it's Bethesda, we would say in English. 
and it means house of mercy. And people would gather around this pool. Not unlike, uh, have you ever been to Warm Springs, Georgia? We had a president that frequented that place quite often. You remember the president? You know what his name was? Delano Roosevelt, right. He had polio, and being in that water helped him. And we find this all over the world in different places. There's something healing and curative about water. And so Bethesda, the house of mercy. Now, verse 4. Most of your Bibles, except if you have the King James Version, uh, King James will not have an asterisk here. It will have this verse. It goes something like this. For an angel of the Lord at a particular season would come down and bathe in the pool and stir up the water. Therefore, the first person who got into the water after it had been stirred was made whole of any disease that he had. Now, the reason the footnote is there is to let you know that in the oldest and best Greek manuscripts, that verse does not appear. It simply goes from verse 3 to verse 5. So the question is, how did it wind up in Greek manuscripts? Well, evidently, there was a, a copyist at some point who wanted to clarify what the man says in verse 7. Notice the man says that I have no one when the water is stirred up. It's the same word that's used in this verse uh, to put me in. So most likely it was inserted into later Greek manuscripts to give more detail than verse 7 gives us. So we would say that this verse was not original in the oldest and Greek manuscripts. But the sense of it is there and it doesn't really change anything at all. But sometimes just looking at your footnotes, you may not clearly understand what uh, it is doing. Now, let's focus on Jesus. What is Jesus doing in this story? Well, he's doing several things. Now, my time is getting away, but we're going to do them quick, okay? The first one is Jesus delights in the worship of God. In verse 1, there was a feast. We don't know which one. It wasn't Passover, or it would have said so, but it was just one of the feasts. And Jesus did the 90-mile trip from Galilee down to Jerusalem to be a part of this uh, worship experience. That's saying something, folks. He didn't have a limo. He didn't have a teleporter or anything like that. He walked every mile of the way or rode a donkey. 90 miles up and down hills and over a couple of mountains. And so he was serious about worshiping God. Now, we worship God corporately, which we do like this on Sunday. You know, our services don't really... Uh, they're not much varied from early synagogue worship, except for the fact of Jesus. That's the big difference. But early worship, there was praise, there was singing, trumpets. Occasionally, we have a trumpet here. Uh, we probably should have more often. They read the scripture, the law, the prophets, and the writing. Every Saturday, they would read a portion of it. They had it arranged that they could do, cover the whole Old Testament in three years in reading in the synagogues. And then they had a thing called the 18 benedictions, 18 statements that they would repeat every Saturday about God being blessed. They're rich, they're wonderful. They had prayers, they gave of their substance that the Lord had blessed them with. And then at the end of their service, all together they would say, Amen, so be it. And that just wasn't a bunch of Southern Baptists from Boggy Bayou. That was the Jews back in the first century doing that. Amen. Let it be so. So there was corporate uh, worship, but there was also closet worship. That's private. Just you and God. And for Jesus, it usually took place early in the morning. He would slip off somewhere to a solitary place, a desert place, and he would worship privately God the Father. And then there's creation worship. 
while you're out, just out and about, could be at the office, you could be driving down the road, wherever, you begin to look for things that remind you of God. Jesus did that. Remember, he was walking along with the disciples in Matthew chapter 6. He said, look, the lilies of the field, how they're growing. And you know what? They are so beautiful. They are more colorful than the robes that Solomon wore. Wow. Jesus noticed the flowers. And you think, man, that is so rinky-dink. No, it's not. Think of a single flower and the complex organism that is in that one flower. God gave it life. The sun, the rain, the soil, all of that, he gave it. How good are you doing at your creation worship? So, Jesus delights in the worship of God. Would you have walked three days to get here today? Jesus did. He did. Number two, Jesus seeks to make people whole. In verses five and six, he notices this man, and he knows that he's been there a long time. He had this problem for 38 long years. You know, I I get upset if I have a cold for a week. I can't imagine having something for 38 years. Jesus asks a very particular question, and he uses this word whole. We get our English word hygiene from this word, and when we think of hygiene, we think of washing our hands. Son, did you wash your hands before you came to dinner? Or wash your feet. Whole had something to do with all of us. Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well, healthy, sound, cured? Jesus is changing metaphors for eternal life. With Nicodemus, he talked about being born again. With the woman at the well, he talked about living water, bubbling up from within you, springing up into eternal life. With this man, he talks about wholeness, soundness, health, a different metaphor for eternal life. Do you want to be whole? Physically, we know he'd had a problem for 38 years, but what about his mental state? Look at verse uh, 6 again, or 7. He says, uh, Sir, I don't have anyone that when the water is troubled to take me into the pool, but while I'm crawling to get there, Another goes down before me. This man had a poor understanding of God and his grace. A very poor understanding. For him, he understood first come, first served. If you didn't get there first, you were out of luck. Is that the way God operates? To the victor go the spoils? No, not at all. What a poor understanding of God this guy had. It's not first come, first serve. It's served if you come, wherever you are. But he, emotionally, something else. <clears throat> he said, I have no man to put me into the pool. This man, evidently people saw him, but they didn't see him. They just walked by him. I got to get in that water first. I got to get there first. First. And they passed right by him. He was a lonely man. He was feeling hopeless. That was his emotional state. If anybody needed healing there, he did. He did. But Jesus asked him, do you want to become whole? Had he lost any hope? Had he lost everything? And he was just waiting for his time to pass on Jesus was looking for that spark of faith do you want to become whole you know Martin Luther somebody in history that uh, he struggled with this he was born in 1483 and in 1505 he was 
trying to become a lawyer and he was walking from one village to another and he got struck by lightning, knocked him down to the ground. And in his terrified moment, he said, Saint Anne, save me and I'll become a monk. Well, he did. His parents didn't like it. They wanted him to become a lawyer, but he kept the vow, went into a monastery and here's what he said. I kept the rule so strictly That I may say that if I ever a monk got to heaven by a sheer monkery, it was I. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, readings, and other work. It was some getting so bad for him that one of his confessors counseled him to love God. And Luther said back to him, I do not love God, I hate him. See, Luther was seeing God as just, only a judge and nothing else. Some, many people have that picture of God. It's a poor picture of God. Well, in 1515, years later, he was studying the book of Romans and his thoughts stopped at chapter 1, verse 17. He hadn't gotten very far. And that verse says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. And that switched for him, his view of God. Here's what he said, Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. From somebody who said, I don't love God, I hate him. To somebody who said, I felt like I was reborn. Jesus seeks to us make us whole. But there's something else. Jesus causes conflict. In verses 9 uh, through 16, these religious leaders get involved because they see this guy carrying his mat. Now, when I was a kid and I read this, I read in King James Version, it said carrying his bed with him. And I thought, he's got to be awfully strong carry his bed. I later learned it was like a mat, you know, like a pallet that you roll out, a blanket. But um, Jesus caused conflict, and he still does to this day. For these religious leaders, this guy was breaking the Sabbath. He was breaking the Sabbath. You see, you you could only do certain things on the Sabbath as regarding work, and carrying your mat was not lawful. It was not legal. It was against their traditions. In fact, we find in the Mishnah, which is the codification of Jewish traditions, 39 different categories for work. They just kept trying to define it, define it, define it until they got it down to just you couldn't do about anything. You might say, well, gee, that's funny. Well, let me ask you this. Why is it okay for women to wear a hat to church and not for men? Where is that? Where is that written in the Bible? I don't know. It just, it's there. It's one of those unwritten traditions. You know, there have been teenage boys asked to leave a worship service because they wore a hat into the worship service. I hope that never happens here. Hope it never happens here. It's amazing the different things that we can draw up as rules and regulations. But not only for the religious leaders was there conflict, there was for the man. For the man. Obeying Jesus put him square in the crosshairs of scrutiny. Man, he got grilled. What are you doing? Why are you carrying your mat? Who did this? Give us his name. Oh, I, I don't know who it was until he found out later. You see, obeying Jesus today can put you in the crosshairs of scrutiny. Let's go back to Martin Luther. 
1520, there was a papal document put out against him, and it went throughout the countryside. And uh, it was called a bull, papal bull. Here's what it said. Arise, O Lord, and judge thy cause. A wild boar has invaded thy vineyard. Luther was the wild boar. The document condemned Luther's beliefs. 41 of his beliefs were condemned as heretical, scandalous, false, or offensive to pious ears or seductive to simple minds or repugnant to the truth. At the end of the 60-day period, they, were giving, they gave him 60 days to recant. Here's what he did. He led a throng of students. He was a professor at a, at a university at that time. More professors need to have what Martin Luther had, by the way. He led a throng of his students outside Wittenberg and burned copies of the canon law and the works of some medieval theologians. He also included the bull that had been put out against him and he burned it along as well. Here's what he said. They have burned my books. I'll burn theirs. You see, following Jesus can put you in the crosshairs of scrutiny. Perhaps your family, perhaps at school, perhaps at work, perhaps in different places. Because you're going against the culture. You're going against presuppositions. You're going against a lot of different things. Jesus causes conflict. But one more thing quickly. He makes outrageous claims. In verses 17 and 18, he said, now look. He said, my father is working up to this moment, and I'm working too. And this really enraged them. All the more they were seeking now to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now the rabbis understood that God rested on the Sabbath from creating, but not from maintaining and sustaining what he had made or else the world would collapse. So they agreed on that. But Jesus is claiming this role for himself. The works of Jesus, are they the works of God? Well, if they are, why are not the works of Jesus on the Sabbath legitimate? He was asking and saying some pretty serious stuff. And then equal with God. We have an example of God making a human like God. It's Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. God can exalt a man as God. But whoever makes himself as God, call down retribution on himself. Jews call that blasphemy. These two things, plus the political charge of causing a revolution, those three things drove Jesus to the cross. That's what put him to death. His outrageous claims. And if Jesus was treated like that, and those of us who call him and follow him as our Lord should we expect anything less one more thing and then we will have our song Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of many Germans during the second world war who was involved to try to get rid of Hitler he was a theologian, had been a pastor, and a seminary professor. Over time, he was caught and put in camp, a prison. One of the best things that we have in Christian history is his letters and papers from prison, the things that he wrote. But you see, he was a threat to Hitler. And just before it was in April of 45 that the Allies came through. Two weeks before they came through and liberated that prison, Hitler gave the final order 
executing. The order came down that morning. They let him out, made him strip naked, climb up on a little pedestal, and they hung him. Because his leader was not Hitler. His leader was Jesus. You see, following Jesus may not be all peaches and cream. Let's pray.